losing 50 pounds. I mean, I, cold, and I don't like cold. So I get uh, some tools, a hot fence handle, and a couple hot fence posts and insulators. And I head across, you know, to get to the depths and thinking, well, you know, what's the worst this could be, you know? So I step off in there and I should have brought my phone up here because this could go on. So anyway, the, uh, I get out there and sure enough, goes over my boots. Over one boot first, cold. All right, so I get started and I get this and this trash runs downhill on the wire, you know. And <laughs> so pretty quick, it's over this other boot. Well, what's you know, so now I'm out in the middle of cold Turkey Creek, putting, the, trying to get this wire up. Well, it's, it stays loose. Well, what's wrong? Well, it, on the other side over here, where the bank goes straight up, there's I got a T post. I had it fixed up pretty good. Well, while it'd been loose and down, they cattle had kind of started walking up the bank. Not far. Well, anyway, it's off over there. So I got to going over there to to fix it. It's a little, I know it's deep over there, so I go back to where the cattle path, it goes across the creek, and I'm thinking, I'm going to follow this cattle path, and I'll be fine. My posts are in. <clears throat> well, by this time, the cold water is up to my knees, and by the time I got to the other side to go up the bank, <clears throat> the cold water is up to my belt line. So it's wet and cold everywhere. So I go over to the other side, get the trash off, and get the uh, get the wire back on the the insulator. By that time, the wire's back to hot, <laughs> and I get a good charge. So now I'm not only cold and wet, but I've been shot. So what's this got to do with giving? You know, maybe it's you sit here and look at your come to church and you think about, oh, man, I, I don't know how much. I don't know if I want to put. Maybe I better put. No, eh, what uh, what we put in the plate today is not about today. It's about what's on the other side after it gets here, after it goes to work to further God's kingdom. And after I got shocked, after I got the hot wire back up, I looked and my pickup was on the other side. And there was just one way to get back around there. So I walked right back across there through that wet, cold water, knowing that on the other side, I was going to get dry and warm. So go ahead and put that money in the plate. It's going to do good when it gets on this side. This church, this board, these people, they're going to see to it that it furthers God's kingdom. Will, can you help take up the offering? I was just sitting over there thinking. Do you know how blessed we are to be in Dover Christian Church? You know those big mega churches? They don't ever hear offering meditations like that. They miss out. They're missing out on what's happening in rural Oklahoma and how blessed we are right here. Let's sing to uh, glory to his name as we take up this morning's offering. Down at the cross where my Savior died.
Thank you for being you, the God of the universe, the giver of all good gifts. Lord, bless these gifts that uh, this loving congregation has offered. Bless our gifts this week as we go through this week and share you with the people that are around us. Lord, uh, right now I pray for those people that... Uh, mentioned in the announcements that have crossed to the other side the people that are looking at crossing to the other side where there is no politics only you and your goodness we can praise and, and worship you all the time all our needs are met as you meet them you want to meet our needs here now today, Lord. All we need to do is humble ourselves and pray and ask for them. Right now, I want to thank you for these gifts, and I want to pray a blessing on each member of this congregation, the ones that are here and the ones that aren't. Be with us, Lord, guide and direct us in your ways and your will. In Jesus' name, I pray and give thanks and all the glory. Amen. Amen. Go ahead and sing. Let's let's go ahead and sing our song. Let us break bread together. save that last verse is the guys will be picking up the cups you have your cups there I didn't grab one I just want to read a scripture again that I thought about <clears throat> it says tells us this in John 6 if you want to go ahead and get your wafer out of the bottom so you have that in your hand it tells us this and this is a little different but I again thought of Chuck Lark he is to me yesterday I tell you the truth, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you will have no life in you. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up on, at the last day. For my flesh is real food, and my blood is real drink. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood remains in me, and I in him, just as the living Father sent me, and I live because of the Father. So the one who feeds on me will live because of me. Chuck again was so worried about what would happen if he wasn't on this journey anymore, what would happen tomorrow. I had to encourage him that there is life after this, and he, he's, he's known that, but he just needed a little assurance. And we prayed about it, and I said, Chuck, Lark, if you're not here tomorrow, I'm going to see you again, and the rest of us are going to see you again, as long as you know that Jesus Christ is alive and well, he went to the cross for your sins, 
and you don't have to worry about what you've been before this. The past is the price has been paid. There is nothing you have to do. And I ain't kidding you in that room. I saw more machines in one room and him hooked up to so many different things. I said, right now, Chuck, I know this is feeling like these things right here are providing you life. But you will have life regardless of what happens tomorrow, the next minute, the next day, because Jesus Christ is going to come and live in your heart if you really want him to. And he shook his head. And what toasted me most is I had a hard time communicating with this big mask on his face. But he took his mask off. He said, that's what I want. And I said, that is what you'll have. Jesus Christ is now in your heart and in your life. You will have life tomorrow regardless of whether it's here or with him. So think about that today. Because as you take this again, as the scriptures just told us, this is the bread that came down from heaven. Your forefathers ate manna and died, but he who feeds on this bread will live forever. So please take your bread. And now if you'll get your cup ready, the same goes for the cup. That this cup, this blood that was shed for each one of us assures us that if tomorrow doesn't come on this journey on this earth, it does go on with him in eternity. Let's partake of the cup. Because of this bread and this cup that we are partake of, partaken of, we can sing this and we should be able to sing it with great joy in our hearts. Now that we have taken of the bread and the drink, let us praise God together. Let us praise God together. Sherry, would you come up and join me? Sherry and I have been with you all uh, for now, what, six months? Something like that. And we would just like to formally place our membership with Dover Christian Church. Amen. We can do that. You know, we are so happy to accept people. We don't let them leave, though. You're going to make the drive from Enid from here on out? Sure? Okay. Yeah. Anybody have any problem with these two joining the Dover Christian Church family? If you're excited about it and filled with joy as I am, say amen. 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 Welcome to Dover Christian Church. Thank you for making that official. Thank you. You're welcome. I need... Uh, I need prayer this morning, so would you uh, pray for me and pray with me? Father God, uh, we just pray for your blessing, we pray for your presence, we pray for your help. Father, I pray that uh, every heart, every mind would be attentive to your word, and that we would be willing receivers of uh, your word. In Jesus' name we pray, and everyone said, Open your Bibles, if you would, to Acts chapter 6, verses 1 through 7, and hold that. We're going to read it in a moment. Uh, but I do have some things that I need to uh, tell you this morning. Uh, we've been having some pretty significant elders meetings on Tuesdays. Uh, and uh, been making some somewhat important, momentous decisions. Uh, one is that the elders and Sherry and I have decided for me to stay on, not as your interim pastor, but as your pastor for a minimum of one more year. Uh, and, you know, we don't know what's going to happen in 2022 or 2023. Frankly, we don't know what's going to happen in 2021. Only God knows. 
but our plans are that, uh, that I'm going to be your pastor for the year of 2021, and we'll see what happens after that. Uh, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> But in a part of doing this, uh, when I came, we were looking for a new minister for Dover Christian Church. Uh, and as Sherry and I have been with you all for the last six months and come to love you uh, and come to respect you, come to appreciate you, we have also come to see that there are some areas where we feel like Dover Christian Church can improve. And we felt like it would be better for the church to face these and to work through them before you get a new pastor that's going to be here for who knows how long, rather than after the new pastor. So sharing that, we can lead you through some of this, and then it's done and the new pastor can go forward. Uh, but if the uh, new pastor had to do it, well, then that would not be quite as good. So the elders have decided, uh, along with me, that we are going to concentrate in 2021 on addressing some of the organizational issues that we think could be made better in Dover Christian Church. You are a wonderful church. You have done marvelous good, and nothing that I'm saying is going to minimize that in any way. But there are some areas in the, in the area of organization where I think that we can do better. Let me tell you what the Christian church is all about. I don't know how much you've been trained and with the Christian church. But, you know, if you were a Presbyterian church or if you were a denominational church, somebody from headquarters would come down and tell you how to do it. And all you would do would salute and say, you know, they have their book of order and they, they tell you how to do it and that's the way it happens. But in the Christian church, we don't have a national headquarters. We don't have a book of order that tells us how to do things. All we have is the Word of God. And we try to follow what is printed in the Word of God. You know, when you read in the Old Testament, and this is one of the studies I've done with the elders, and someday I'd like to do it with the, with the whole church. When, uh, when God was telling Noah how to build the ark, he says, build it out of this kind of material and build it this high and build it this long and make sure that you would follow the plan. Do everything according to the pattern. Uh, when God was laying out the tabernacle and all the furniture in the tabernacle and the, uh, and the veil for the tabernacle and all the vestments for the priest, over and over and over, he said, and make sure you follow the pattern. Do everything according to the pattern. And so we come to the New Testament church. We come to the New Testament. And we feel like in the New Testament there is a picture of what the church is supposed to be like and how the church is supposed to function. And we don't want to be creative. We don't want to do things the way John uh, Dusendorf thinks it ought to be done or the way Jimmy Birkenbeil thinks it ought to be done, or more important, the way Beth thinks it ought to be done. <laughs> and we don't want to do it how Philip Wilson thinks it ought to be done. What we want to do is go back into the New Testament and try to discern the way God's Holy Spirit wanted it to be done, and then we want to do all things according to the pattern. That's our goal. We want to be a Bible church. We want to be a New Testament church. And so I want to stand before you and I want to tell you that to the best of my ability, with the leading of the Holy Spirit, I'm not going to tell you to do anything that Philip Wilson wants you to do. But I'm going to try to open the Word of God to you and to show you what the Word of God says. And in 2021, we are going to address some of these issues and we're going to say, Lord, what do you want Dover Christian Church to be? And how do you want Dover Christian Church to function? And though you've been with us in the past, God, how do you want to lead us 
this year and in the future. And that's what I want you to pray for me for uh, and for the elder. It would be far easier to just ignore it and to let you do the way you've thing, always done and that way you would love me. Because when I come in here and start tinkering with the machinery, some of you may not like me anymore and I really want you to like me, <laughs> okay? And so, and so uh, pray, for, pray for me. Uh, you know, sometimes we don't know whether the chicken come first and then the egg or the egg come first and then the chicken. And, you know, and, you know, I guess ideally we would change the Constitution bylaws and then do it. But what do you change it to? And so we're going to deal with the issue biblically. We're going to look at them as a church. And everything that I present to you has already been presented to the elders and the elders have already approved it. And what I'm going to be presenting to you this morning on the biblical role of deacons, you are listening. And then elders, listen up. This coming, not, not, not today, but one week from now, on Sunday evening at 5 o'clock, all of you who are elders, or if any of you would like to think that in your future you might want to become an elder, we could invite you. You just need to let Jimmy and Beth know. But... Uh, all of you elders, I want you to come to Jimmy and Beth's house, Jimmy and Beth's barn, and we're going to feed you, get you in a good mood, uh, and then we're going to pray together, and then we're going to talk about this with you, uh, and then we're going to, as best we can, answer any questions, because if there's going to be any, any transition, you know, there's going to be some change <laughs> and uh, that's a difficult word for for all of us and so first of all we present it to the elders and we present it to the congregation and then we present it to the deacons and then we ask for God's help <laughs> and we're asking for God's help through all of that with all of that that's what we're going to this morning we're going to talk about the biblical role of deacons you may have noticed that this is now in January, the middle of January, and we have not had a board, church board meeting, a congregational meeting to approve the deacons. And this is the reason, because as we have been studying this, we wanted to delay until we had done a Bible study and until we had talked about it with the elders, and we've done that, and now talk about it with the congregation and talk to it about the deacon. We don't want to do something and then have to undo it and then redo it. We want to just begin again. So with all of that in mind, I want to ask you to open your mind and consider deacons according to the Bible, and we're going to read from Acts chapter 6, verses 1 through 7. If you have your Bible or if you want to read the uh, scripture, you may follow along. In those days when the number of disciples was increasing, the Greek-speaking Jews among them complained against the Jewish-speaking, the Hebrew-speaking community because their widows were being overlooked in the daily distribution of food. So the twelve gathered all the disciples together and said, It would not be right for us to neglect the ministry of the word of God in order to wait on tables. In the Greek, that word there is deacon. It's the verb, not the noun. In order to serve tables, uh, to deacon tables if you wanted to. Brothers, choose seven men from among you who are known to be full of the spirit and wisdom. We will turn this responsibility over to them and will give our attention to prayer and the ministry of the word. This proposal pleased the whole group. They chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Spirit. Also Philip. Oh, there's an honorable mention. That is a good name. Uh, and Philip, Procurus, Nicanor, Timon, Parmenas, and Nicholas from Antioch, a convert to Judaism. They presented these men to the apostles who prayed and laid their hands on them. 
So the word of God spread. The number of disciples in Jerusalem increased rapidly, and a large number of priests became obedient to the faith. I want to start out by talking about the word deacon. The verb is used in this text, but when we talk about deacons in, uh, in the church, we're talking about the noun rather than the verb. But the noun can learn from the verb. The verb is serve. The Greek word is dikonos, and the English word is deacon. Notice, delta in the Greek is D in the English. The I in the Greek becomes the E in the English. The A in the Greek, the alpha in the Greek becomes the A in the English. The kappa in the Greek becomes the K in the English. The omicron in the Greek becomes the O in the English. And the nu in the Greek becomes the N in the Greek. And so now we have a brand new English word. The English word is deacon. You spell deacon, D-E-A-C-O-N, because in the Greek it was Delta, iota, omicron, compa, you know, nu. That's what you call a transliteration. It is a letter-for-letter letter transfer. The word deacon is not a translation where we have the meaning of the word. It is a transliteration. We take the literal letters of the Greek and make them the literal letters of the English. So the word deacon, dikonos, has never been translated. We just created a brand new word. So what does the brand new word mean? Whatever you want it to mean, it's a brand new word. And so throughout church history for the last 2,000 years, we have accumulated meanings of the word deacon that come from our culture, that come from our history, that come from our traditions, not from the Bible. So what we want to do is go back into the New Testament and say, when this word was used originally, what did it mean then? And I don't have time, and this is not the place to give you a class in Greek, but let me just tell you, the word simply means serve or servant. It means help or helper. It means assist or assistant. And so a deacon, biblically, is somebody that helps, that serves, or assists. That's the meaning of the word. It is never a title, a position, or an office. It is always a function. And that's what we're going to see in the scripture this morning. So as we look at Acts chapter 6, verses 1 through 7, the uh, scripture that we read, the first thing we notice is that there was a problem. The text says, in those days when the number of disciples was increasing, the church was growing. And growth always causes a problem. Growth causes change. I was thinking about this uh, biologically. We'll start there. When I was born, I probably weighed between 8 to 10 pounds. I didn't look it up. It's on my birth certificate, I guess. But that would be about what I, what I weighed when I was born. I normally laid on my back, and my legs those little tiny legs were sticking up in the air and I would kick. Can you see me like that in your, in your mind? And so my grandmother, or my mother, my mother's mother, somebody, they probably crocheted some little booties for me. And they put these booties on my little feet. And when I laid on my back and when I went like this with my legs, they said, oh, look, those cute little booties. They served their purpose. But pretty soon, I became a crawler. The booties would not do, and so they gave me a different kind of shoe. 
And then I became a walker. And then they gave me a different kind of shoe. And then all of you that have had kids, you know, as the kids grow, when they're in that fast growing stage, you have to get them new shoes two or three times a year because the toes start reaching the ends of their shoes. And, and if you leave the growing foot in the new, in the old shoe, you're liable to crinkle those toes permanently. And so you continually, as you grow, get them new shoes until pretty soon you get up to something like this. And, you know, I have a number 12, triple A. And I've had that for a long, a long time. My foot quit growing. I, I used to be a preacher at First Christian Church in Crowell, Texas. And down on Main Street, there was a Crowell's General Store. And that's where we went to buy our clothes. That was back when the little town still had clothing stores. And I went in there, and I bought a pair of Red Wing boots. Irish setters, and they still make them. They cost a whole lot more now than they did then. You lace them up about uh, eight inches or something like that. And I've kept them oiled. I've kept them greased. You see, I bought those red wing boots after my foot stopped growing. You know, I've had that pair of red wing boots now for some uh, nigh on to 40 years. And I still have them can still wear them if I go out on a farm to work, which I don't do that very much anymore. But when I quit growing, you, you have some? <laughs> yeah, I, heard, I thought about that. But when I quit growing, I didn't need any different size, different kinds of shoes other than as my function changed. So it is biologically, it is also that way organi uh, organizationally. When the church grows, things have to change. Now, I want to tell you that this is a continual process. I want you to just imagine that this church grew to be 2,000. Now, it may never happen in Dover, Oklahoma, but if this church grew to be 2,000, the organization that was required then would, not, would be totally different than anything that we would do today. And what we're going to go to today is going to be different than what it was five years ago or ten years ago. If the church would grow to be 10,000, and there are some, the, the largest church that I know of, a Southeast Christian church in Louisville, Kentucky, Bob Russell used to be the pastor, and uh, the last I heard, it ran 23,000. I want to tell you, the organization of a church like that is radically different. You couldn't have congregational meetings in a church like that. Uh, it would be so chaotic that it would be, it would be dysfunctional. So the uh, church in the book of Acts was growing in those days when the number of disciples was increasing. They had a growth problem. They also had a benevolence problem. A benevolence problem. Somehow or another, they had made a good decision. They had widows in the church that needed food. And I believe if a church has widows that need food, the church ought to give them food, don't you? Yeah, I believe that with all my heart. And they had made that decision, and it was a good decision. And it was the right decision. They did the right thing. And so they had some organization. Their church was also a biracial church. They had uh, Greek-speaking Christians, and they had Hebrew-speaking Christians. And uh, maybe most of the people were Hebrew, and they just couldn't understand the people that spoke Greek. I don't know why, but the Greek-speaking widows were not getting as much food as the Jewish-speaking widows. Now, can you imagine what their church board meeting was like? How many of you love your mother? Come on, how many of you love your mother? And if your mother was a widow, and if your mother was not getting as much food as a Jewish-speaking widow, do you think you'd step up and protect your mother? I can imagine this congregational meeting of this church. It was pretty hot. People were yelling at each other in the church. You're taking care of your mother, but you're not taking care of my mother. You're taking care of the ones that speak Hebrew, but you're not speaking, taking care of the ones that speak G Greek. I think everybody ought to get the same amount of food. And the apostles were standing over there, and they were going, Woo! 
How are we going to handle this? They saw that something had to change. That's the context there. They had a benevolence problem. They had a racism problem. They had a prejudice problem. And uh, so they said, we're going to change this. There was the wrong solution that could have, they could have come up with. They could have said, we're just going to let the apostles take care of it. Peter, James, and John, they were all leaders in the church. We want you all to take care of this widow problem. And uh, Peter stood up with 11 and said, no, not my problem. That would be kind of the same as if you all as a church would say, hey, we're just going to let the elders do everything. Wrong. Or we're just going to let the preacher do it. Think that's a good idea? No. No. Say no. Say, hey, tell me, tell me no. No, it's not a good idea. No, no. Okay, there was a wrong way to do it. Let the apostles do it. But there was a better way of doing it. There was a better way of doing it. Number one, there's three things I want to tell you. Number one, it says choose seven men from among you. Now, I don't think seven is the answer for every problem. There have been churches that said deacons should always be seven because it was seven here. But that was what they needed for this problem. A problem might need three, a problem might need five, a problem might need two, it might just need, just need one. But right here in this immediate context, it says choose seven men. What do you see here? This is an important concept. This is fundamental, church. This is the one that you need to pick. This is what is called representative leadership. Say that with me, will you? Representative leadership leadership. What the apostles were saying is church, every member of the church is not going to decide how to take care of the widows. We're going to get seven people that represent you and then in this meeting of these seven, they are going to decide how to take care of the widows. You got that? Representative leadership. So when you choose representatives to handle an issue or a problem or a function, that means that you are going to have to release your control and ownership of that because you now have a representative that takes care of it for you. Representative leadership. Fundamental. Very, very important. Number two. Choose seven men. And the apostles saying, we will turn this responsibility over to them. We will turn over to them. This is not representative leadership from the apostles' perspective. This was dele D -E -L -I, delegated. That's no, is that spelled right? Delegated authority. D-E-L-E. -E. Is that right? Dele it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. We're not in a spelling class anyway. Delegated authority. That is, these seven people that you selected, we are going to give them the authority to deal with the widows. And they're going to decide how to do it, what's right, what's wrong. In church, your responsibility is to follow the decision that they make because they're your representatives. So representative leadership, and number two is delegated authority. We will turn it over to them. And then number three, we will turn this responsibility over to them. Now note, this is a limited responsibility. Say that word with me. Limited responsibility. Note this. The deacons were not responsible for the salaries of the apostles. The deacons were not responsible for, name it, whatever. They were not responsible for taking care of the horses and the mules that pulled the carriages when they went to Bethlehem. 
They were, they were responsible for the one thing that was delegated to them to be responsible for. In this case, taking care of the widows, making sure that they all had the same amount of food in the daily distribution. Limited responsibility. So deacons don't take care of everything. They take care of the one thing, the responsibility that have been, has been given to them. Note the word this. You might translate it one and only. If you become a deacon, I don't know whether you're a deacon or not, but since you're close, I just talked to you. That's Chase is way off over there. <laughs> if you're a deacon, you will have a responsibility, and you will be responsible for the one responsibility that has been given to you. You don't have to take care about this and this and this and this and this. Those are not your responsibilities. But you would have one area of responsibility that will be given to you. Does that make sense to you? When church started this morning, uh, Robin Green came up to me. And by the way, I told him I was going to use him in church this morning. And he said, don't make me go to the front. And he was adamant about that. You can stay back there. And he said, and I won't say anything publicly. You don't have to say anything. I just told you I was going to talk about you. He came up to me and he said, where are the individual serving communion cups? I said, I don't know. Robin ordered some in the mail. Uh, she probably knows where they are. Let me ask you this. Is the preacher responsible for getting out the communion cups? Now, I'm not mad at Rob, at, at, at Mr. Green, you know, and, and he's not a deacon. Note this, I'm not responsible. He is not responsible. Sherry, are you responsible? No? Are you responsible? Beth, are you responsible? Who's responsible? Maybe there's somebody, I don't know. But we're going we're gonna to appoint somebody and we're going to say this is your responsibility and we're going to turn this over to you and we don't want to have church and be wondering where the communion cups are for the rest of the world until Jesus comes. We want to organize it for it to happen normally. Somebody is going to be in charge of the worship service. Now, that does not mean that the one person that we've given this responsibility has to do it every Sunday for the rest of their life. They can organize it any way they want. They can say, you do it the first Sunday, you do it the second Sunday, you do it the third Sunday, you do it the fourth Sunday, and if they can organize it that way, that's fine with me. I don't care how they organize it. I don't care who does it, but I want one person responsible because we want to make it you know, we're here for the Lord. We're here for His glory. And chaos does not, does not give the Lord honor. We can do better. We can do better. Now, I'm just using that as an illustration. I could go on and on and on. Do you all remember when I first came here about four or five months ago, I kind of made a joke about uh, that Jimmy Birkenbaugh had three lights on him. And over here... There was a light out, and I only had two lights shining on me. You remember that? How many of you remember that? We yeah. heard that meeting every week. <laughs> <laughs> hey, here's the point I'm trying to make. I mentioned that five months ago, and that light bulb is still out. Now, this isn't about light bulbs. That's not what I care. But... But the problem got worse. Instead of one being out now, there is one, two, three. There are four out now. And so the Lord's communion table is kind of in the darkness. Now, I don't think the Lord's going to have any convolutions about that. But I just think that if we're going to do God's business and God's way and give God glory, we ought to do it the very best we can. And having four light bulbs out over the communion table is not a way to glorify God. It ought to be done right. It ought to be done the very best that we can do. Now, who's responsible for light bulbs? Well, we could each look around. 
we probably don't have any one person that's in charge of the auditorium. But we've asked the elders on the past, and the elders are not too good to do it. Just like the apostles were not too good to serve the widows, but that's just not the best organizational process. We are going to identify the problem, and we are going to choose somebody out, and we are going to give this responsibility to them, note, so that we, the apostles, can spend our priority time on the ministry of the word and prayer. If the elders are doing everything, they can't do the things that they're supposed to do the very best. And the preacher is not supposed to take over the church and do everything. We're supposed to organize ourselves to take care of the problems and the needs in an organized, orderly way so that God gets the glory and the lost people are saved and the saved people are discipled and encouraged and we all are happy and enjoying God and enjoying each other and, and enjoying the church of heaven. Somebody clap your hands and say praise God. <laughs> so that's where we're headed. We are going to develop representative leadership, delegated authority, and limited responsibility. Coming straight out of the scriptures. So, let me, uh, it may take two or three years to get everything all, you know, we can say, okay, we want to be, have a, somebody to do this, but if nobody's willing to step up to the plate, we're going to have to keep on doing it the way we've always done it. But we're going to start praying for and looking for and asking for that one person that will take the responsibility and say, this is my job. And, uh, you know, we may be able to do it in three weeks. It may take longer. We don't know that God is in charge and you are in charge, but uh, the elders are not in charge and I'm not in charge, but we're going to give it our best shot. How do we propose deacons will function at Dover Christian Church? Each deacon will have a specific responsibility. Uh, right now we have deacons that don't know what they're supposed to do. I feel sorry for them because you feel a burden of responsibility because you're a deacon, but you don't know what to do with that responsibility. You haven't ever been told. And if I was a deacon and I had the title and I didn't know what I was supposed to do, it would make me feel bad. And I might even be a little bit angry at the church. You're taking advantage of me. You're telling me what to do. You're, telling, you're giving me the name, but you're not telling me what to do. We may have fewer deacons, but each deacon will have a specific responsibility. What this means is that some of you that are deacons now may not be deacons until we have developed the responsibilities. And, and they may, well, I know the church needs a light bulb specialist, but I don't want that job. I don't want to, you know, that's okay. You know, we'll work it out. I believe that God is, in head of, God is the head of the church. The Holy Spirit is the empowerment of the church. You know, Jesus paid for the church, and it will get done. Uh, and God will receive the glory. The number of deacons will be the number that are needed. Hello? Does that make sense? We're not going to have 25 deacons if we don't need 25 deacons. We're going to have three deacons if that's what we need, or seven deacons if that's what we need, or ten, or whatever. Now, when we talk about need, let me clarify this. You have on-campus needs and you have off-campus needs. On-campus is taking care of light bulbs, taking care of communion. Off campus might be, hey Robin, taking young people out on an outing. Uh, one time I was here once and we went out and we repaired a roof on somebody's house. Uh, somebody might have a lawn mowing ministry. You know, if people are sick with COVID and they can't mow their yard, let's send a team out and let's mow their yard for them. Hallelujah. Wouldn't that work? And so those are off-campus needs, and they're on-campus. The last thing we want is to use everybody on on-campus needs and not do anything off-campus. But on-campus needs to be done. And so, you know, the number of deacons will be the number of needs. How do we do this? 
specifically, and I'm going to abbreviate this because I know this is kind of nuts and bolts, but we're going to be doing some of this during the year of 2020. So cut me some slack. First of all is identify a need. You, the congregation, any member could identify. You know, if, you, if you're a member of the church and you see something that needs to be done, go tell an elder about it. Identify a need. If an elder sees a need, well, then you can do it. Or the preacher could identify. I don't care who identifies the need, but if there's something that needs to be done or something that could be done, first of all, you identify it. And then the elders would discuss it, and if the need is uh, decided to be genuine, we would announce it to the congregation. We might even make a recommendation. Let me say, see now, what's your name? What? Leonard. If Leonard came up to me and said, I noticed that there are six light bulbs out above the audit, uh, uh, on, the, on the stage, and we ought to have somebody take care of it. Well, then I might take that recommendation to the elders and say, we need this to be handled. And if we agreed in the eldership that need to be handled, then I might come to the congregation and say, we need a person that will take care of light bulbs. Now, I'm being a little bit facetious. That probably wouldn't be the title, but that's the illustration that I'm using for today. Or I could, you know. And uh, some godly person, man or woman, doesn't matter, might come up and say, I'll do that. We've identified the need. We've communicated the need. We have found the person that is willing to serve in the meeting of that need. That person would be interviewed by the elders because there are biblical qualifications. That needs to be a person full of the Holy Spirit and wisdom. We don't want somebody that's going to disrupt the church and lead them toward Satan. We want them to be harmonious people and lead them toward the Lord. But assuming they're a godly person, then we would take this person up before the congregation and say we have a need. We've announced this need. This person has been recommended. This person is willing to serve in this area. We want to give you a congregation two weeks to pray about this person. And if you have any reason why this person should not be a deacon in this church, then you write it down on a piece of paper and you sign it and you give it to any of the elders. And we're, we're going to deal with it confidentially. You see, this is biblical. If a person has audience, a person go to him and talk about it. Maybe, it. maybe your reason was not a real good reason. Maybe it didn't really happen. You just heard it on the gossip chain and you thought it was true, but it wasn't true. Uh, maybe it happened 40 years ago and it's been repented and forgiven and it doesn't, doesn't matter anymore. Uh, maybe it's just wrong. Or maybe it's right and you are protecting the church to keep an ungodly person from being in a godly position. But after two weeks, if the elders don't have any, any negative report from the congregation why this person should not be a deacon, then we're going to call this person before the church and as the elders, we're going to ordain this person to be a deacon of Dover Christian Church who is going to have this particular responsibility. And that model comes straight out of the passage of Scripture that I read before you today. And our purpose is to make the church a better church, a more biblical church. Let's pray. Father, thank you for sending your Holy Spirit to us today, helping us to see in your word and to meditate on your word and to apply your word. Father, we love you. We don't want anything bad. We want only good. We want for the betterment, for the enjoyment of each other and for the enjoyment of God. I thank you for Dover Christian Church. I thank you for all the men and women, boys and girls that are here. I thank you for those that are coming that we don't know about yet. 
And Father, it's all for you. It's all for your glory. We ask for your help, God, because we can't do it by ourselves. We pray this in Jesus' name. And everyone said, Amen. Amen. Are you glad you were here today? This, uh, this word right here, if there's anything that you haven't noticed already, we as elders have noticed anything that Philip has brought to us or to our attention and things that need to happen within this church, you can always find it right here. So if you have any problem, and I'm going to make something clear, that's what I know when Philip called me, I was texting somebody. I was actually tasting chase, or texting Chase. Because Philip invited the elders, just pretty much the elders, but it is deacons on Sunday night also uh, to come. You said elders. You're welcome. But what I meant is all you deacons are invited to Jimmy and Beth this coming Sunday night, a week from today, at 5 o'clock for food and for prayer and to answer any questions and uh, any discussion that you might have. We're going to have a little shop talk. Uh, this invitation had this in mind. I knew what the message was going to be about today. But it also is for all of us. The invitation for us is, yes, if you don't know Jesus, to exactly for sure to come and join and, and ask him into your heart. But so many of us, and I've heard some of you here ask the questions, just what are we supposed to be doing in this world day after day in this time that we're going through? I found out this way this week. Just make yourself available for God to use you. There's not a single one of us here that God can't use. And he can take your life and he can make you a blessing. Pay attention as we stand and sing these, this song. Make me a blessing. That's our invitation. Listen to the words as we sing them. Says your Savior, this is your opportunity to do that. If anybody wants to join the church, if anybody just wants to rededicate your life to the Lord, well, this is the time to do that. Out in the highways and byways of life, many are weary and sad. Carry the sunshine where darkness is rife, making the sorrowing glad. Make me a blessing. sing the last verse but I just feel led to ask because Wednesday night this place is going nuts around here <clears throat> and we as elders appreciate so much those that are reaching out to so many young people in this town I'll tell you I'm first one here normally on Sunday morning and we find things here and there and everywhere I guess maybe what's enticing this for extra prayer for them is JD called me this week Jimmy we got some electrical issues this light works, this light doesn't, this one does, this one doesn't. So Robin gets on the phone and calls an electrician, one that's actually on their way to my house. And I find out at my house, well, Robin had already called me, just some breakers had been turned off by some great kids that we're glad they're here because we're ministering to them. But I'd like to ask Randy, Robin, Crystal, uh, Chase, you work with the young people, come down here and we're going to pray for you that that ministry continues and God continues. I wish Kelly was here so we could pray for him also, but he's, he'll find out. But as we sing this last verse, if you help with the young people's ministry, people, we are reaching lives of young people that need to know Jesus. And these, these people need our encouragement and our prayers. So if you're one of the young people ministers, find your way down here. We're going to pray with you before we close. Let's sing the last verse. Last verse. 
See 